I'm just so broke you won't believe Can't get a dollar out of me And as far as I can see I'm losing control like a bad disease No, I just can't get relief I've been shot down by the life police Cause every day I try to rise but I can't succeed Can anybody find a cure for me? You can be bitter, bitter, bitter Or you can be better, better, better Where do I give you love and I just started school and people like to pick on me because I'm different and weird and all that. And I usually like to crack jokes to make me feel better. If you could change one thing in your life, what would it be? Well, we have a lemonade stand where we're giving lemonade away for free. Do you want a free glass of lemonade? Hi, would you like some free lemonade? All we ask is that you make your life lemons into lemonade. So, can I destroy this now? right now is that I broke up with my boyfriend. Three, two, one! Proceed! The positive thing is that we both get to spread our wings and fluff. Hey boys! My lemon is that I'm always fighting with my sister. I miss my family. My lemon is that I've been holding a grudge. My lemon is an uh, issue I had with my sister over social media and I stopped having communication with her for like over a year and I would actually like to get to talk to her again which would be my lemonade. Let's take your phone out. All right. Let's do this. There it goes. Sis. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. It's, it's been a while since I've seen you, and I just wanted to say hi, and I miss hanging out, so. I love you, too. Come over, bring it in, bring it in. Bring it in. Oh, that was awesome. Best lemonade ever. Hi, would you guys want some free lemonade? Yeah, would you guys like some free lemonade? Great! I have insecurities, my thighs touch, I have a gut, and I say screw all of that. <laughs> my lemonade for sure is loving myself. Yeah! Mm. <laughs> loving me tastes so good. When I was born, I had this lemon bite and made to lemonade. And now I can hear what people say. I love the sound of guitar, rock music. I'm too good at the sound every day. Yeah! <laughs> All you see people is cooped up in their phone, walking with their head down with a frown on, getting upset about any and everything. But people went out of their way to be like, let's do something positive for a chain. Let's give away something for free. Let's have people get whatever's on their back off of it. And let's do something positive for the community. We've been married 54 years. Is that lemon or lemonade? I suppose. <laughs> I can either waste my life being bitter or I can use my life to be happy and loving, and I choose sweet lemonade. My lemonade is good health. To new friends, new beginnings, sweet forgiveness. More patience. Yeah! We have great friends. We live in a beautiful part of the world, and life couldn't be much better. So no matter what your lemon is, you can always have lemonade from it.
I've lost the sound. I've lost the show. There. Go ahead. Try it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. She said, I'm going to start singing, Mom. What should I sing? A Baptist belt song. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. So here she goes in a low, beautiful voice, and she's singing. She still has her mask on. She finished. Tears were rolling down her cheeks. And the whole place there, with maybe 30 people, clapped. Wonderful. She said, wow, I've got still something there, haven't I? I Some said, yes, hope. you have. Yeah. And then she went in to see her doctor, Dr. Ross. And Dr. Ross said, hmm, Laura, all these people are coming in and saying there's a beautiful girl out there who's seen. Now, could that be you? She started to smile. And he said, listen, we want you to sing in about another few weeks. The, the program is coming up, the lung and heart transplant Christmas show. Wow. And there'll be over 400 people there. Now, if they trust you in singing, they heard you out there. I trust you, will you do it? She said, but Dr. Ross, I haven't even practiced my, my lungs yet. He said, you do it. She was so thrilled. We went home, we started practicing. And a few weeks later, she was in that lunch, that dinner with over 400 people, lung and heart transplants. She got up and she sang, let it snow, let it snow. Oh. And she, at the end she said, and let it snow in Los Angeles also. Oh. <laughs> and oh, she got an what ovation. A, a but you know, years later, a few years later, she has had her music studio with lots and lots oh, of that's, people. That's wonderful. Um, it's, a mu it's singing and it was piano. And she's done so well, and she's oh. still alive and lives in so Vegas. Wonderful. But so it was a, a lemon. We didn't know how it ever turn out, exactly. but it has been a lemon aid for her in so many respects. Thank you so much. So you have a copy of the Serenity poem on one side of your paper. Um, it's longer than the one you're familiar with. And we have a sweet senior citizen that's going to give her version of it. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. Taking as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. As I watch that video, I wonder about her life, what kinds of challenges that she's faced, probably some of the same ones you have. So uh, there was a young man, grade school age, who kept who had a lemonade stand for five years and gave away all of the profits. Now, some of us, many of us, probably all of us, have had a chance to have someone help someone else change their lemons into lemonade. And here's the young man telling his story. Um, I started this project when I was in first grade. A charity came to our school and they asked each class to earn $86 to give wheelchairs to people in other countries. And I came home that day and I asked my mom and my dad, can I do a lemonade stand and car wash? My dad was like, car wash, what? I was like, lemonade stand and car wash. And he was like, how about just lemonade and cookies? Mom makes good cookies. I was like, okay, that's fine. And so we did it a couple weeks later on spring break and I earned enough for one wheelchair. And so I've just done it every year since. When he first came home with the idea to do the project, we thought, this sounds good, something fun we can help him with, but we never dreamed that it would turn into what it is or that we'd still be doing it five years later. So far, we've raised around $50,000, around 300 wheelchairs. It feels, just feels good to...
to know that you're actually helping someone, to know that someone who can't walk now has the ability that they could go get a job, they could live their lives how they wanted to. So good for him, right? Yeah. So now we're going to see if question, I mean, comment. I just want to tell you that the other night I was watching Wheel of Fortune with the celebrities and one of the celebrities was doing his charity for Zach's Lemonade Stand. Oh, cool. And I thought, what is that? So I looked it up and he won quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I thought oh, it was kind wonderful. of interesting. It's still going. So it's growing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we're going to see a few videos now of people in wheelchairs. The first two, someone helped them turn their lemons into lemonade. I'm trying to think what I want to say about that. One of them is a brother helping his younger brother. And another, you know, Carol Makita? This is about her younger brother, the second one, okay? There's no distance these brothers wouldn't go for each other. Brent pushes and pulls Kyle through 2.4 miles of swimming, 112 miles of biking, and 26.2 miles of running. Their dream is to compete with some of the best athletes in the world at the Ironman World Championship in Hawaii. Six years of training has led up to qualifying day for entrance into Kona. It all started with Brent did his first Ironman in 2010. He invited the family, and now we get the name that not only what Brent did, but all the other athletes did. It kind of reminded me of, of what I go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Kyle knows what it means to overcome challenges. He has cerebral palsy and is unable to use his arms and legs. So when Kyle saw his older brother competing, he knew he wanted to do it too. The brothers started with smaller races, progressing to marathons and triathlons, but they always had their eye on the Super Bowl of Ironman triathlons. When we did our first triathlon back in 2011, everything was preparing. There's not a clear path for people like Kyle and I to compete in Kona. Brent trains seven days a week, and Kyle joins him once or twice a week. It's hard to take somebody that sits in a wheelchair 16, 18 hours a day and run them through the paces of a 140.6 mile race. It's not easy um, for anybody, you know, so that thing that, that motivates me in racing, the, the, one, of the, one of the reasons I race is always next to me or always in front of me. And we just keep pushing the bike forward. And the journey is so sweet because we get to spend 17 hours together. And that way tight is on. Brent and Kyle have always been close. Growing up, Brent looked after his younger brother, and the two had a special bond. Kyle and I were always on the same team. We always changed the rules around. That's what we love about Ironman, is that there's no rule changes for us. The race is Saturday morning at 6.30 a.m. when the gun goes off for everybody. Yeah. Brent and Kyle have crossed many finish lines together, but this one is about to become their most memorable. Kyle and Brent, on behalf of Iron Man, because it's the 40th anniversary of Iron Man, we would like to invite you two to race in Kona this year. Yeah. And inspire us for another 40 years. Their finish time didn't qualify them for the world championship, but their passion and commitment got them a spot. Kyle and Brent were awarded an Ironman ambassador athlete slot to Kona. Each year, select athletes are awarded this honor based on characteristics that go well beyond competition. And we just, one of the best things is the athlete that I'll never forget. As Brent and Kyle train for the World Championship, they hope to continue to inspire other people with disabilities. We just want to give people hope that they can do anything that they put their mind to. And so they have 
founded the vehicle to do that. Here today, this is actually the right way to, to celebrate 10 years, is to just be out here together. If you had told me 10 years later we would have, you know, 80 plus families a year that we were supporting, you know, 700 finish lines, a truck, a van, employees, I wouldn't have envisioned it being what it is now. I mean, at the core of what we do is inclusion. And so we're creating inclusive experiences for people with disabilities. And I think that, you know, a lot of people like Kyle, as, as they get older, there's less and less for them to do. And, and it's, it's, it's also less to do, but it's in a way that doesn't always necessarily make them feel like they're fully included. And that's what this is. Um, how long is it? I don't remember it. <laughs> yes, I want to do it. So on to our next story here. Babies are busy. They move quickly, and with a blink of an eye, they can dart right out of sight. But when a youngster snuck out of the back door, his sister came to the rescue, just as he landed in the family pool. So scary. CTV's Heather Butts has the story of a little hero who proves anyone can save a life. Yeah, are you here? Lexi's smile lights up the room as her mom tells the heroic tale when this young girl found her powerful voice. All of a sudden, I'm upstairs and I hear her screaming like bloody murder. Lexi was able to let out a life saving shriek, alerting her family her baby brother was in trouble. And where did you point? To the door. We've never heard her scream like that. Kelly, a busy mom of three, was preparing for Lexi's birthday. The nine year old who lives with cerebral palsy was sitting in the kitchen watching it all unfold. And then bringing stuff outside and in, and he was napping at the time. So then I was like, all right, he's up. I'm going to run upstairs, get changed. Mom brought him downstairs for me. We didn't communicate about, oh, the door isn't locked. Leland was placed in the kitchen. His grandmother turned around for a few seconds. And just like this, he slipped out the back door. And the scary thing is, is that he opened the door and closed it behind him. And he had never opened that patio door before. That's when the birthday girl became the hero. She's yelling and she's pointing at the door. And I realize Leland's not with her. The 18-month-old was already heading for the pool. Did Leland go outside? And she goes, yes. So I took off outside and I'm, I'm not seeing him. I ran and he's right by the edge and I took him out. Leland coughed up some water and was later taken to the hospital as a precaution. I hugged her and I cried and I still thank her every day because honestly in that matter like two seconds makes a huge difference within two days of the incident happening the family installed this new fence and a locked gate between the house and the pool lexi was honored by the halifax regional police and her local mla awards she is very proud of her efforts will also be recognized at city hall this week you don't need to be able to walk and talk and be able to do every, have all your senses. You can still make yourself heard and you can still help. And yes, she did save his life. Making this one birthday they'll never forget. Heather Butts, CTV News, Dartmouth. My heart is exploding. Doesn't that just oh give my you goosebumps? It's just amazing. <laughs> Lexi, Great you're a job. hero. You are a hero. You definitely saved the day. It's pretty amazing. And right. so glad that there's a happy ending to that story. It's a, that's a lesson to all of us to yes. watch our baby. There have been plenty of nightmarish moments. There's been a lot of, of hospitalizations, of death sentences issued. But I was given a sense that my life meant something to someone and that my life had a purpose. His life has had great purpose. Thanks to his mother's constant strength and optimism, Steve graduated with high honors from Duke University, followed by BYU's law school. And for over 20 years, he's been Utah's assistant attorney general, representing numerous state agencies that help protect the disabled.
I always knew that, yes, life would have its challenges and its inequalities, but at the same time, it has a great deal of meaning and beauty and opportunities to serve and, and to love. And so I set my mind on achieving things to better the lives of other people. Yes, please. So there was a newspaper article, August 26th of this year about Steve and he's just retired. And um, because of a new medication, he can finally do this. Um, let me see, fraction, let's see. It's not much of a turn, almost undetectable, but fractions of inches make a huge difference for someone who hasn't been able to do this since he was in his 40s. Uh, I'm retired, but I've never been busier. He's a pa patient advocate uh, on no less than 10 national health committees. Uh, he has 20 student aides who rotate attending him around the clock. Obviously, he would need that. Is that my phone? Yeah. <laughs> That happened one time when I was giving a talk in church. <laughs> I still haven't learned to turn it off. Um, okay. So um, Mike Shalapi was student body president. Do you know? Do you know Mike's story? You know about him. Okay, he was student body president at Mountain View High School, and he was with a buddy. And the buddy was buddy's father was a police officer who had left his gun out and the buddy was playing and shot him in the chest he emptied emptied all of the bullets and was playing around and shot him in the chest and um he came from that an athletic family his sister played i think it was basketball for for byu and he played basket, basketball and Within the process of time, I need to look at my notes. He became a member of the U.S. Olympic, um, yeah, what's it called? Paralympics. And they won two golds and a bronze. And uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. While attending by BYU, Shalapi was the sports manager of the men's basketball team from 1982 to Six. After graduating, he earned a master's degree in business and healthcare from Arizona State. He later founded Wheelchair Sports Foundation, a Utah group dedicated to organizing sports teams for people with disabilities. And in April 1998, he was named to the Salt Lake Olympic Organizing Committee Board of Trustees. Okay. Switching gears, what would you name a three legged dog? <laughs> Tripod. Tripod. Okay, tripod story. It's like a king in a chariot, you know, he observes the world and people, he barks at the squirrels and he barks at motorcycles. The wheelchair is tripod's home. Tripod was uh, tied behind a shack. He bit through the rope and he landed in the road and a taxi broke his leg in three places. He was left next to the road to die. That day they were going to put him down. Tripod hobbled to me and he sat next to me and he looked up at me. And when that happens, I said, this dog is not going to be put down today. They amputated his leg and they gave him to me. He was given to me at the time that I was broken and he was broken. I was in a motor car accident and I can't remember anything about the accident. 
I uh, experienced panic attacks. And that developed into severe depression. Depression is something you can't explain to anybody else. It is just the inability to do anything. It's a dark hole, it's a, a nightmare, it's a, it's an abyss that you look into and, and, and there is no, no coming back from it in your mind. Nothing helped for me, uh, psychiatry, medication, nothing. Something in Tripod changed me. He makes me laugh, he makes me do all sorts of things that I would never have done before. I could never, never show happiness. Tripod has taught me to show what I'm feeling and talk about it. And if I feel I'm a bit upset or something, I just have to go for a walk with Tripod. I just go and sit with Tripod. And it, it changes. Tripod has taught me to be forgiving and accepting and loving. And it's a risk. You have to take that risk without being scared. He opened my eyes to that. Sweet, right? So the concept of beauty for ashes has been on my mind lately. Do you want to see the LPS wheelchairs first? Oh, sure. Yes, it's a good one. <laughs> I got my coach. So the project that LDS Charities approached us with is to design and create and prototype a attachment system that will attach to the front of the wheelchair that will transform this wheelchair into a chain-driven, multi-geared pedaling system that they can have a continuous pedaling motion so that they can travel these longer distances. The LDS Charities have five different sizes of wheelchairs that they are making and distributing around the world. There's a lot of people that need a wheelchair that need to go a longer distance, and that's just you know much more difficult physically in a wheelchair. So a hand trike enables them to go a longer distance with, with less effort. Here's the trike. Basically, you have a, the LDS Charity wheelchair, and the goal is to attach the trike system to the wheelchair. The person will roll up in it. They'll lift the attachment up off the ground, set it down, and it will attach via pins to the brackets that will be on the wheelchair. We're super excited about this project and the trike attachment. It's going to work with a lot of different models of wheelchairs. You have your shifter and your brake. Brake right here. So. While you're pedaling, you can both steer, shift, and brake. We have seven different gears that they can utilize as they start out on, you know, maybe on a little rougher terrain. It's very easy to go. As they get going, they can get up to 12, 14 miles an hour on this thing and, and get moving. It allows the user to pedal continuously up at a chest level instead of using the wheels on the wheelchair down by their knees. The motion from pedaling the trike is going to be a lot better than pushing forward on your wheels that you normally do in the everyday life. But with the motion of pedaling with the trike, it's going to give us that different motion. I can see a lot of benefit of having the trike and getting that movement where you're pushing back using those different muscles and it, it just kind of allows for a more efficient use of your energy. They could go the longer distance to get there. They could take the trike attachment off and, you know, maneuver and be mobile in their wheelchair in a different environment. It's going to be a useful device because people need to get around faster in wheelchairs. And LDS Charities in the, in the wheelchair program, you know, we're really trying to empower people with disabilities to be mobile and to be able to do something more once they have that mobility. I think this is really a product that will be a life changer for a lot of people. We expect to manufacture probably about 5,000 a year, and our hope would be to have this in mass production by the end of this year. Isn't that a great idea? Isn't that so wonderful? Do you know who invented it? What's that? Google. Google, girl. <laughs> LDS Charities Wheelchair. Isn't that marvelous? What a blessing to so many people. Yeah, okay. So the concept of Beauty for Ashes has been on my mind quite a bit lately. And Gerhardt's going to show a picture of my granddaughter, <coughs> Lindsay. That's Lindsay, her husband, Alex. Oakland and Aiden. And Lindsay posted this. I need the light. 
on, let's see, on October 1st, Lindsay posted this on Facebook. Life truly changes in a moment. This week I was driving up Provo Canyon with my kids, admiring the fall leaves and later learning that our current home I was afraid this would happen. And all of our belongings succumbed to a house fire. In the last few days, I have felt complete hopelessness, but have been wrapped in love, support, and God's grace. The list is long of people who have provided monetary donations and belongings to assist in the enormous gap in our lives. Oh, you did the text up there. I could have had somebody else read it. <laughs> I've got the other one. Oh, good. But you want a picture? Yes. So, what has Lindsay focused on? Everyone's alive. There were only two in the home at the time her husband and his mother. He climbed out a window and got her out. Um, other than that, they had pretty much they had pretty much nothing. Good insurance and many people that responded to their needs. In fact, Lindsay was at my house this morning. Okay, so you're going to post the other one, and maybe I can. Okay, somebody read. David, you have a good reading voice. Would you read that, please? Oh, there you go. God is good all the time. We were driving home from school and saw people on site placing David's headstone. Okay, let me tell you who David is. David is Alex's father, Donna's husband, and he died within the last year. And they had, what's the word? Scanned pictures for the funeral. And that is the only pictures they have left. They lost mission journals and pictures. Yeah, along with other things. Go ahead, David. Such a neat experience to watch the workers install it. I was flooded with gratitude. This got installed as quickly as it did. After the week we had, it was nice to be on site and show my mother-in-law, Donna Cacholes, it's done before winter. There will be lots of popcorn parties here and Oakland is beyond excited to decorate grandpa for Halloween. How about that? And surely Lindsay has times that she would just like to break down, but I think number one, she's strong. And number two, she's gotta be strong for the families. Excuse me, I'll get over this. Okay, so. Uh, Beauty for Ashes reminded me of a church video, The Refiner's Fire. You may have seen that one. My plan for my life was to have a child every two years. I had that mapped out. I was going to have a kid every two years. I didn't know how many. I wanted a big family. So we had a boy first, and then two years later, another boy. And uh, at 22 months old, we found um, a tumor. Suddenly, we were thrown into a whole different world, a world I didn't even know existed. And we were thrown into the medical world, into surgery into the hospital, into chemotherapy. I had my daughter right before we found his tumor, one week. 
before we found his tumor. He had this rare disorder. I'd never heard of it. You know, there was nothing more that could be done. He did pass away at home. In the meantime, we had another son. It started with my daughter. She got um, bone cancer on her rib. My husband got thyroid cancer. And then he got Burkitt's lymphoma. I've never seen chemotherapy that tough. Drew got bone cancer, just like his sister. It was more intense this time. And then Andrea got cancer from her chemotherapy. She needed a stem cell transplant. My husband was diagnosed with the same thing as my daughter. Andrea recovered very quickly. Drew kept getting bad news and bad news and bad news, you know. My son passed away three weeks before my husband. I began to think, maybe I couldn't do this. You know, maybe I wasn't strong enough. You know, I began to think that I might fail, but the Lord was not gonna allow me to fail. And I know that that's not unique to me, that he does that for everybody. It's not always about us. Like, we're not going through this because we need to change or we're not good enough. I, I became someone, you know, more capable of, of helping others and of having compassion and of understanding at an intimate level, you know, what other people go through. And I found a great deal of joy in using the things that I've learned um, to help other people, especially families who have children with cancer. One of my missions in life is to comfort others who are going through cancer. And that, you know, I know how to do it because I've been through it. It's like, to me, it's like Newton's law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Equal and opposite. So I think the greater our sorrow is, the greater our capacity is to feel joy. I've been surprised. I. <sighs> I feel a great deal of tenderness toward my Savior because He really is so sweet. He really does provide what you need. So continuing with the theme of Beauty for Ashes, um, three more videos. Not far from where my family lived was the city of Dresden. Those who lived there witnessed more than a thousand times what I had seen. Massive firestorms caused by thousands of tons of explosives swept through Dresden destroying more than 90% of the city and leaving little but rubble and ash in their wake. In a very short time, the city once nicknamed the Jewel Box was no more. Erich Kestner, a German author, wrote of the destruction, in a thousand years was her beauty built, in one night was it utterly destroyed. During my childhood, I could not imagine how the destruction of a war our own people had started could ever be overcome. The world around us appeared totally hopeless and without any future. Last year, I had the opportunity to return to Dresden. 70 years after the war, it is once again a jewel box of a city. The ruins have been cleared and the city is restored, even improved. During my visit, I saw the beautiful Lutheran church, Frauenkirche, 
The Church of Our Lady, originally built in the 1700s, it had been one of Dresden's shining jewels, but the war reduced it to a pile of rubble. For many years, it remained that way, until finally it was determined that the Frauenkirche would be rebuilt. Stones from the destroyed church had been stored and catalogued, and when possible, were used in the reconstruction. Today, you can see these fire-blackened stones pockmarking the outer walls. These scars are not only a reminder of the war history of this building, but also a monument to hope, a magnificent symbol of man's ability to create new life from ashes. And then there's the Provo Tabernacle, which we will see next. While the scorched bricks of the Tabernacle shell were still standing, inside it was a complete loss. The priceless pioneer woodwork, pipe organ, and history of the iconic edifice all destroyed. Clearly there will be sentiment on all sides to, to try to make this building what it once was. I just hope that's a, even a possibility. As firefighters dug through the rubble the day after the fire, a painting of Christ was salvaged from the inside, a small miracle in the midst of all of the destruction that gave people who loved the tabernacle reason to have hope. The tabernacle would sit on these stilts for months until a new foundation was poured and the original building was finally back on solid ground. While well, the fascinating process of supporting the brick shell captured the attention of onlookers, an equally important task was going on behind the scenes. Within the walls of the fire-ravaged tabernacle, crews sifted through the rubble, discovering a few items that would be instrumental in the design of the new temple. Can you go back a second or two where it shows the stained glass window? The tabernacle would sit on these stilts for months until a new foundation was poured and the original building was finally back on solid ground. While the fascinating process of supporting the brick shell captured the attention of onlookers, an equally important task was going on behind the scenes. Within the walls of the fire-ravaged tabernacle, crews sifted through the rubble, discovering a few items that would... Is that the old glass? Yeah. And it's interesting, the new glass, um, the base of the glass is, is gray, representing ashes, and then the rest of it is, yes. Be instrumental in the design of the new temple. Just go to the next one. And there are many lessons in nature about how to build our individual resilience. Fain boss can go through fire and rise up again. That fire allows seeds that have been buried, you know, to now open up so that they can thrive. And to see that landscape green after all the fire had destroyed it. It's a constant reminder to us as human beings. We might feel like we're devastated by the circumstances in which we find ourselves, but there remains inside us things that would let us rise up again. There are bad things that are going to happen, but out of this goodness can come.
when we experience pain and when we experience suffering and we experience a setback, they just remind us that there's a part of us that is strong. If we're anchored by our values, you're surrounded by a community that supports you and you do things that are aligned with your own purpose, you'll be able to grow taller. So now I'd like you to think of someone you know that has changed the lemon in their life into lemonade. And while you're thinking, I'd like to tell you about Eileen Mackey. She and her husband had saved and saved, finally had enough money to build a home. And he was working on the home and a trench came in on him and killed him. They had four children and uh, their grandma took care of them while Eileen came down to the Y to renew her teaching certificate. And she rented from my grandmother who was a matchmaker. Now my father had been single for 10 years. My mother died when I was six years old. And those two got together and she became the most excuse me, wonderful stepmother I could have ever designed. So she made beauty for ashes. And of course, a lot of people helped her with that. So now I'd like to hear your stories of someone you know who has made beauty for ashes in their own line. We have about three minutes, which is not enough, but we'll give it a, a start. And you don't have to stand up if that's keeping you from <laughs> Anyone? Can I talk about an animal? Sure. Okay. I have this black cat. I mentioned that we born in Luigi and we speaks Italian, okay? But one day I opened the door and there was a scroungy yellow big cat. And I thought, where did you come from? He was feral. And he would hiss at it. <laughs> I said, oh, he looks so terrible. I can't believe him. I don't want to take care of you. Why did you come to my house? Do you think I have food for you? You know? And then I looked at him and his, his fur was all mangled. And, and he had one half of his ear was missing. And he had this poor look on his face. And I thought, oh, I feel so sorry for you. I don't know what I can do for you. Please go away. <laughs> he didn't. He wanted something to eat. So I have some crunchies, and I thought I'll start out with crunchies. I'm not going to give him expensive meat. So I'll start out with crunchies. And, you know, I put a few crunchies down, and he goes, shh, shh. And I thought, <laughs> oh, I'll never be able to tame him. Why don't you just go away, you know? I didn't have any faith in this animal. You know, so I kept giving him crunchies and I thought every day he'd come, you know, and finally I got so mad. I took the bowl of crunchies and I threw it at him after he hissed at me. I said, now you just go away because you're not changing and I want you to change it. Be nice. Be a nice kitty. Right. Like Luigi. Well, I thought I've got to be kind. You know, he's here for some reason to change my life, maybe a little bit. Maybe I'm not so compassionate with all of the animals as I should be, maybe, but I kind of love animals, but maybe I'm not so kind. So I thought, okay, I'm going to talk to you. I'm not going to hiss back. I'm not going to throw your crunchies. I'm just going to say, you're a good girl. You're wonderful and you're becoming beautiful. And you know what? And I thought, I am going to see if how much I can really change her. So I started doing this to her. When I would see her, I would go, I She's blinking her three eyes. Times, so three times I would doing weep. That. And that says to you, that says, it makes me want to cry. I love you. And every time I saw her and I would feed her and I'd say, She's a, you're beautiful and I love you. Oh, tender. And so one day she started to get, I gave her meat because she was behaving better. She stopped hissing at me <laughs> and she was behaving better. And so now she's just beautiful. You can't believe how her, her fur looks. She is absolutely beautiful. And she'll come in the house a little oh. bit and she'll let us pet. We can pet her. My son is out sunbathing and she's out there on his lap. Oh, oh she's just a sweetheart. But she will do, I love you. Oh, for heaven's sakes. 
I don't know if she understands what that means. To her, it probably means I am hungry. <laughs> oh, I love that story. I love that story. It looks like our time is almost up. Gerhard, do you want to post the yeah. guest house? And you, you're the other one with a good voice. Would you read that one? And then we'll be done. Kill the front lights, please. Say me? Yes, yes you're, the, you're, 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 you're the other one with a good I voice. You said Dave. Well, you're the other one with a good voice. This, Dave, Dave, this Dave probably has a good voice too, but we'll. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a nearness. Mean. A meanness. I'll put on my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still treat each guest honorably. He may be cleaning you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. And I think at our age, we've learned that, haven't we? Yeah, the hard times are blessings. We don't appreciate them at the time, but anyway, it's been delightful, thank you. Turn me off.